You said you wanted to survive the movie. Do you really want to? You get what I'm saying. What are you prepared to do? Well, I mean, anything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? You open the can on these worms, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they're not going to give up the fight until one of you is dead. Is that supposed to be Sean Connery? Yeah. Academy Award winning Sean Connery yeah. in <laughs> The Untouchables. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to episode 118 of the How to Survive podcast. My name is Joe, and joining me as ever is Chris Morris. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah? Yeah, how are you? You sound, you sound a little down in the dumps. What's wrong? No, no, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. I'm upbeat. I'm looking forward to um, to uh, talking about The Untouchables, Yeah, which is our film this week. Yes. Got a little bit of liquor to uh, get us through it. Yeah. Uh, very appropriate. Well, it's banned, isn't uh, it? Yeah, but Elliot Ness, he would not approve. No, he wouldn't. If you don't know what we're talking about, maybe you should go and watch The Untouchables. It's available on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's a stream. And mm-hmm. in all good VHS bootleggers. Yeah. <laughs> um, Charity shops. Yeah. It's a good film. It's the first time in a while that we've watched a film that is good, I think. Right. Uh, more on what I thought about it later. And I want to know what you thought about it as well, Chris. But first... That's very kind of you. We'll recap the plot. Yes, please yeah. do. Because I've forgotten everything that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers are ahead for The Untouchables. You can't spoil real life, Joe. It happened 80 years ago, Joe. Yeah, in real life. Yeah. Everything in the film happened. Yes. Really happened. Word for word. Sean Connery Literally, was in it. word for word. Every word is verbatim. Yeah. It's actually a documentary. Yeah. The We're Untouchables, doing- 1987. Mm-hmm. Roll the trailer. God, it's going to be a dreadful trailer, isn't it? Mm. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. Sometimes a reputation follows you. Robert De Niro is Al Capone. There is violence in Chicago, of course, but not by me and not by anybody I employ. And I'll tell you why, because it's not good business. Kevin Costner is Elliot Ness. I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. Sean Connery is Jimmy Malone. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's it, the Chicago way. You just joined the Treasury Department, son. Everybody knows where the booze is. The problem isn't finding it. Let's do some good! The problem is who wants to cross the pond. Somebody messes with me, I'm gonna mess with him. You carry a badge? Yes. Carry a gun. Get your hands in the air! You're all under arrest! You fellas are untouchable. Is that the thing no one can get to you? Hey, everybody can be gotten to. All right, then. So, the untouchables. Mm Mm-hmm. This is a recap I stole from Wikipedia because I forgot to write one. So any S- any typos are theirs, not mm. mine. It's a film about a group of germaphobes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they'd, be, they'd still be touchable. They'd be like the un, untouchers. Right. The non-touchers. Non-touchables. Mm. During Prohibition... Quality stuff, this. <laughs> <laughs> During Prohibition in 1930, Al Capone has nearly the whole city of Chicago under his control and supplies illegal liquor. Bureau of Prohibition agent Elliot Ness is assigned to stop Capone, but his first attempt at the liquor store raid fails due to corrupt policemen tipping Capone off. Mm. He has a chance meeting with Irish-American veteran Officer Jimmy Malone, who is fed up with the rampant corruption and offers to help Ness, suggesting that they find a man from the police academy who has not come under Capone's influence. Mm. They recruit Italian-American trainee George Stone, a.k.a. Giuseppe Petri, for his superior marksmanship and intelligence. Joined by accountant Oscar Wallace, assigned to Ness from Washington, they conduct a successful raid on a Capone liquor cache and start to and start to gain positive publicity, with the press dubbing them the Untouchables. Do you know what? I I could not believe that Oscar Wallace wasn't played by the same guy who's the um 
Dana's apartment block. Rick Moranis. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, yeah. absolutely uncanny, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah. And he's one of the untouchables. Carry on. <laughs> Capone later kills the henchman in charge of the cachet mm. as a warning to his other men. Mm. Quite a brutal scene. Yeah, the bat, baseball bat scene, yeah. which apparently is uh, inspired by real life. a real event. I thought the whole thing was. Well, at Ooh, least it's by word for word. Uh, it's, uh, it's apparently Al Capone killed. Two, he got wind that two of his henchmen were mm. going to try and off him. And so he invited every, all of his people around for dinner mm. and then killed them both with a baseball bat in front of everyone else. Yeesh. Mm. Not to be trifled with. Wallace discovers that Capone has not filed an income tax return for some years yep. and suggests that the team try to build a tax evasion case against him since he is well insulated from his other crimes. An alderman offers Ness a bribe to drop his investigation, but Ness angrily refuses it and throws him out of the office. And then a younger man tries the same thing. <laughs> when Capone gunman Frank Neaty threatens Ness's family, Ness has his wife and daughter move to a safe house. Mm. His team flies to the Canadian-US border to intercept an incoming lip- liquor shipment, aided by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, mm. killing several gangsters and capturing George, a Capone bookkeeper. Malone then shoots a gangster through the mouth, not revealing that the man is already dead, mm-hmm. to scare George into agreeing to testify against Capone. Yeah. Wallace prepares to escort George from the Chicago police station to a safe house, but they're shot and killed by Nitty, who has infiltrated the station. Mm. Sort of under the, you know, through the help of the police chief, it seems. Yeah, he seems to be at least um, you know, yeah, yeah. aware of it. Yeah, he lets it happen. Mm. Maybe not fully complicit, but yeah. he, he doesn't uh, doesn't turn. He turns a blind eye. Yeah, literally, literally, literally <laughs> takes his eyes out. <laughs> Ness confronts Capone and his men over the deaths, but Malone intervenes to save him from being killed mm. and urges him to persuade the district attorney not to dismiss the charges against Capone. Realizing that police chief Mike Dorset sold out Wallace and George, there you go. Yeah, Malone forces him to reveal the whereabouts of Walter Payne. Capone's chief bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. That night, a knife-wielding thug sneaks into Malone's apartment. Malone chases him out of the door with a shotgun, but falls victim to Nitty's... Nitty? Nitty? Nitty. Yeah. Uh, Falls victim to Nitty's Tommy gun ambush. Mm. Ness and Stone arrive at the apartment. Before dying, Malone tells them which train Payne will be on as he leaves town. So there's only two left. Yeah, two untouchables. Mm. Two have been touched. Yeah. Well, I, when uh, Oscar Wallace gets killed, of course, uh, yeah. Nitty writes touchable yep. on the wall in his blood. Yes. Grim. The work of a sane individual. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, Nitty's a nutter. Yeah. Nutty. I call Nutty. It. Yeah. Right. Brilliant. At Union. <laughs> Keep them coming, mate. <laughs> At Union Station, Ness and Stone find Payne guarded by several gangsters. A gunfight breaks out on the lobby steps, resulting in all the gangsters being killed and Payne being taken alive. As Payne testifies at Capone's trial, explaining the untaxed cash flows throughout the syndicate, Ness notices that Capone seems unusually relaxed and spots Nitty carrying a gun under his jacket. Ness has the bailiff remove Nitty and searches him outside the courtroom. Mm. Though he, he has the mayor's permission to carry the weapon, Ness finds a matchbook in Nitty's pocket containing Malone's address and realises that Nitty killed Malone. Mm. And that's like... You know, referring back to a scene that we'd seen earlier when he lights a cigarette using the matchbook and we see that he's got the address. Yes, exactly. Nitty shoots the bailiff and flees to the courtroom, courthouse roof. Ness gives chase and in the ensuing confrontation pushes Nitty to his death mm. after Nitty mocks the way Malone died. Yeah. But like, like runs him off the roof. Yeah. Like he might as well like lift him over his head and like <laughs> throw him yeah. like King Kong or something. It's crazy. Yep. And a bad way to go. Yeah. And it gets, it gets a nice James Bond style one liner there. Where's Niddy? He's in the car. Yeah. Because he fell through the roof of the car. Great. Great. Stuff. Died on impact. The words of a cold blooded killer. Stone gives Ness a list taken from Nitty's jacket that shows bribes paid to the jurors. Mm. When the judge refuses to consider it as evidence of jury tampering, Ness bluffs him into thinking that his name is in Payne's ledger of payoffs. Mm. The judge subsequently throws out the jury to be switched over with one in another courtroom prompting Capone's lawyer to enter a guilty plea on his behalf. Yeah. Instantly. Is that how it works? Yeah. Doesn't even like yeah. try and bribe the next jury. Just like the lawyer 
is like the lawyer's gone, listen, the only, literally the only hope we have is if you bribe the entire jury. Oh, I'll do that. Yeah, and then like as soon as the juries get switched, like yeah, it's guilty. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> lock him up, throw away the key. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Capone is later sentenced to eleven years in prison. Ness closes up his office and gives Malone's St Jude medallion and call box key to Stone as a farewell gift. Mm. As Ness leaves the police station, a reporter mentions a rumor that prohibition may soon be repealed and asks Ness what he will do if that happens. Ness replies. I'll listen to the How to Survive podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And mm. what does he actually say? I'll have a drink. Mm. What are your feelings on that ending? So my, I, it does make you think. It's a good ending because it makes you think about that. Really? So, yeah, because he, he says, you know, I'll have a drink, mm. which says basically I don't really care about the prohibition. I'm not yeah. morally opposed to liquor. Yeah. But these are men breaking the law. Mm. And even if I don't agree with that law, that's, you know, it's a bit weird. But yeah. The thing it's is, sacrosanct. yeah, the thing is, he doesn't really care about the law, I don't think, by the end of it. What he cares about is putting away Al Capone because yeah. Al Capone is a horrible person. Correct, yeah. But I think in some ways, the last line is a sort of intended to be like a sort of just a nudge wink, like, mm. oh, I think I'll have a drink, you know, that yeah, sort yeah. of tone. But to me, it just feels like what a futile exercise this whole film was. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, I, like yeah, yeah. I, people I are mean, yeah. dead. Like dozens of people are dead. Yeah. And like at the end of the film, it's just like, oh, that thing that all these people have died defending one side or the other, it doesn't matter anymore. Like people yeah. have arbitrarily now decided that that's no longer an issue. I see what you mean. But I do think historically speaking, looking back on the Capone case, most mm. people consider that he justice was served to him on the basis that they found a loophole in yeah, tax and stuff. Yeah, no, I, right? I agree that Al Capone should have gone to prison. Yeah, like, and I think, totally. I think that is the, that's the message of the film. Is like, of course, yeah. yeah it yeah. doesn't matter for prohibition. It doesn't really matter about the taxes. No. What happens is that you got a man arrested and right. really tried for, like put away for crimes he committed, even but though he wasn't tried for them. In its own way, it reminds me of the ending of The Mist. Right. You know, like where everything, like <laughs> it's basically saying like everything was futile. Yeah. Like all the decisions and the actions that all the characters made throughout this film, like only serve to make the situation worse because if they just waited, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But the like, because also if, if you put Al Capone away for tax evasion, mm. you could do that without all the violence anyway. Yeah. Like you could do that without all the like raids on the liquor stores and raids on the like smuggling of the uh, alcohol across the border and everything like that. Like I know they have to get hold of a bookkeeper and everything, mm. but the like it just makes all of the alcohol related backdrop to the film seem completely futile. And like the way they use it is like a throwaway, like nudge wink line, almost like left a sour taste in my mouth because it was like, so yeah. sort of disregarding all of the deaths that right. the, it, the film had worked so hard to make me care about. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're basically saying that that like putting that line in Ness's mouth, it says like, who gives a fuck basically about it. Yeah. Him. Cause he's, he's like, he's, I, I would prefer him to have no opinion on it. Mm. Like I'd prefer him to be like mortified. Like I'd prefer for him to be like <laughs> so upset that his friends die fighting a war based around this idea that then some people in another state mm. or like national lawmakers will just arbitrarily decide doesn't matter anymore and it's not worth pursuing. But I think that's... Like he was, he, when he started trying on prohibition, he, it was never about prohibition. No, I know it's it not. Was I know, Capone. I know, but he, like, your point is that Elliot Ness is uh, a character for whom the law is sacrosanct and he, like, but no, he would, but no, he would my, die that's, defending. That's no, not but my I point. mean, like, I mean, the, the because I, mean, I, I don't, I believe the opposite. I think he, st he starts out like that, but by the end, he has become a gang leader. Right. He has to become the thing he's chasing. Yeah, right? yeah. I, 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 see, I see that. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he basically becomes like a violent you know, vigilante yeah, by yeah. the end. Yeah. But like, I, to be honest, I found the whole, like the final 10 minutes of the film just bizarre. Yeah. It, from when he throws <laughs> Nitty off the roof, yeah. it, that is cold blooded murder. Like yeah. he would go to prison for that shortly. Well, no, he's a police. Police can't just, you know. I'm afraid they can, mate. Look, look oh, at the world, 2017, mate. yeah, mate, yeah. And no, but obviously different times or whatever. Yeah. And like, there was no, cctv but if a police officer did that you know like i don't know the names of like leaders of criminal gangs or yeah. hitmen or whatever but like let's say someone arrested uh someone who was going to commit a terrorist atrocity or whatever mm -hmm. 
and they executed ca- them. <laughs> captured yeah and, and executed them by throwing them off a building in a city yeah. like imagine if someone captured some like a jihadi or a member of isis or whatever in london yeah. and then threw them like off the walkie-talkie building yeah like it would be insane yeah. it would be the maddest thing that's ever happened like <laughs> yeah i think the movie is very very melodramatic right yeah in a way that i don't think movies are anymore and the 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 peak moment for that is when malone gets shot with a machine gun mm. that absolutely peppered yeah and then it reminded me of a line in the um, movie from a few years ago, Lawless, right? where Gary Oldman's character says something like, do you have any idea what a Thompson machine gun can do to a mortal? Yeah. Right? And the answer is it can fucking rip you to yeah, pieces. Yeah, to ribbons. Yeah. yeah. Whereas he drags himself like to the safety of his living room yeah. and then waits for everyone to arrive and then dies and then in a very soap opera way. Right. And it's like, you wouldn't get that in a movie anymore. You take something like right. No Country for Old Men, right? There's a scene in that where a character dies off screen and it's when when you, the, it arrives at the body mm. you're just like so shocked and it's it's the the brutality of the murder is shocking yeah and more emotional than and he's he's like apparently been sprayed with a machine gun yeah by the looks yeah, things, yeah. yeah yeah but the like i think more and more in movies like even in james bond movies if someone gets shot they generally die now yeah and it it's the finality of their death is what's moving yeah Whereas in this, it's like there's no finality in death. It yeah. takes like 25 minutes. Yeah. The um, For me, and what I thought you were going to say was um, the scene in which they all fly to Canada so that they can be in one scene of a Western movie. Yeah. Which is just mad. Like that's it, sort of yeah. the strangest thing. Because it even, it almost like the whole way the film is made changes suddenly. Yeah. And it suddenly feels like a 1950s western it really like feels that way when they're in that um uh, that hut yeah and there's a scene where they they're all like anxiously waiting yeah. and sean connery like goes to each of them and says stop fiddling with the gun stop yeah, yeah. biting your nails Stab or your feet, yeah. yeah and the camera doesn't cut i don't think it, yeah. it sort of just moves around this very like theatrical looking yeah, set yeah and it feels like a classic western where you'd have these scenes that go on for minutes without cutting yeah and they're just moving like around them, yeah. these like richly designed sets. Yeah. But and then, I, I, and then I, you've got them fucking riding on horses and stuff. Yeah. And like, you've got this inspirational music yeah. where they're like, da, 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 da. and like the scenes that you're watching right. while they're doing that are like fucking blowing people away with shotguns and stuff. It's yeah. just crazy. Like it's such a mismatch for me with the rest of the film. Like obviously, right. like you say, from that point, it's only like that point onwards, it turns into the sort of melodramatic mm. uh, shootout film. But like up until that point, it's been sort of quite procedural and quite sober. And then like suddenly the four treasury officers are riding horses (laughs) and firing shotguns with one hand. It's crazy. It turns into young guns, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It turns into like a a Western soap opera. What I would say though, that I love Westerns and I'm on record for saying that. Yeah. It's like one of my favourite scenes in the film because it's so stupid. But it is like, like bullets don't work in this film. (laughs) They get, people get shot and they'll be like, I'm oh, fine, don't worry about it. But then another person gets shot and is blown across the whole of the field. Just yeah, like, yeah. Uh, it's, it's silly. It's yeah, very it's, silly. it's very silly. But, yeah. do you think but that, like, I don't think, I don't think the film up until that point is particularly silly. But do you think... Like, the, a, the film opens mm. with the bombing of a shot with a six-year-old girl inside. Yeah, I agree. Do you think, though, that there's an element of, of form showing function in the sense that... It's, what, the film becomes more of a Western as the characters become a little more wilder. like a stereotype. There's that, but, they, but, there's, but also, they, there's also the fact that it's, it's a Western, which in the 80s when this movie came out would have been an old style of filmmaking. Right. But the things that happened in it wouldn't have happened in a Western. You wouldn't get people shooting each other with Tommy guns in no. a Western. So it's kind of like saying the old ways don't work anymore. Right. What you need now. But, but the problem with that is that it's only when they switch to the old ways that things do work. Yeah. Like there's, there's not, there's not enough of an examination of the myth of the, like, like no country for old men, which you mentioned a minute ago is literally a film about the old ways not working anymore. There's no country. This is no country for old men. Whereas in this film, this is saying in no country for old men, Tommy Lee Jones rides in on a horse and saves the day. (laughs) (laughs) That's what this film is saying. It's basically only by becoming cowboys will we beat modern mobsters. Well, I think, I think in that case, it's probably a saying they're literally becoming wild men. Right. And that it works. But there's no examination of that myth and there's no comeuppance yeah, yeah, for them yeah, yeah. doing that. In no, the you're right. You're right. It's, there's, there's lots of it that feels like they had more scenes that were stripped out. Yeah. 
I can't really yeah. put a finger on the exact scene. But it's, 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 um, it's a biopic that is much more a pic than a bio. Like, <laughs> that's what I think. I agree. So obviously the city hired Ness. They brought him in. Mm-hmm. But the city seems to fucking love Capone. Like top to bottom, everyone's happy with Capone. Yeah. The, like the only people who don't like him are his enemies who are other gangsters. Yeah. And he does seem to... Like, the, the, the way they set up like Capone's a bad guy is because he kills... Or someone, someone he hired kills a child. Yeah. Um, well, he kills indiscriminately and he's indiscriminately violent, it seems. Yeah, and he's running racketeering and stuff. Sure. Which is, I, I'm not saying in any world that Al Capone could be considered a good guy. Yeah. He's obviously a psychopath who is trying to run a business by mm. using fear and violence. But the city, like the mayor and all the police are in on the gag, right? They, they, they're in Capone's pocket. Yeah. Uh, so why, why did they bring Ness in? Who's, who's sent him in? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's like, it's almost like it would make more sense if Ness was shown to be sort of incompetent at the start. Yeah. Or like he was a bit of a laughing stock. Yeah. But that's not the case. He's very together and knows exactly what he's doing. Exactly. He's yeah. like the guy you bring in when you want to... He's suave and like sophisticated yeah. and... Yeah. Yeah. It's, if if Oscar Wallace was the main character, then it would make more sense because he's like this weedy, nerdy like treasury guy yeah, who learns how to shoot and fight and yeah, yeah exactly like and that would be more compelling as well because there'd be more of a character arc yeah. if he then became like a violent thug yeah. and threw nitty off the roof at the end whereas you've got the the satisfaction of seeing a a good policeman doing good police work yeah it's like with the version that we've got is like kevin costner is playing james bond going from his desk job to getting his license to kill right yeah and indiscriminately murdering s- criminals yeah exactly so how quickly did you know Sean Connery was going to die? Well, he's playing like the, the archetypal... Uh, yeah, like, white haired. Yeah. Yeah. No family, no friends. Right. There to impart his knowledge and then provide uh, yeah. emotional resonance when he dies. Yeah. Didn't yeah. really work for me. But he won an Oscar for it, so yeah. what who, do I know? Who are we to judge? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, there's, there's a lot of tropes at play in this film. Mm. But is it... Is it using tropes that were already around in the late 80s? I think so. It's probably the epitome of them, isn't it? It's, it feels like a classic Hollywood crime drama, yeah. doesn't it? It's not... Um, one of my problems with this film, I think, is that while it's good, it's lacking in that sort of grit that you find in the Scorsese gangster films. Right, yeah. Um, because, like, bullets don't work or anything. Yeah, and, and as, as a result, it feels like a weird sort of middle ground between a Western like a Scorsese gangster movie mm. and, like, Forrest Gump. Right, yeah, yeah. It's oh. very, it's very optimistic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And but the, the, you get the Scorsese elements in the the scene with Al Capone smashing someone's head with yeah, a baseball bat. Yeah, but bag. even that is like it cuts away, and yeah. you know, you don't see you don't see that much. Yeah, but like if if in the end of Goodfellas you had like the shadow through the back of the head, so his mother couldn't even give him an open casket, and yeah. then he crawled into the next room and waited for forty five minutes for his friends to show up so he could impart the final words of wisdom. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, there's the the. There are like very good things about the film, and I think the best bit of the film is the um, train station shootout. Yeah, it's pretty like so. You don't care about mindless goons in movies getting shot, right? No, and you never do. But the way, like the the best part of the film mm. is this scene because even though it's just mindless goons getting shot, yeah, they have a pram in the middle of it all. Yeah, so. You, they, it lasts like five minutes. Yeah, you get. Um, but it's like it's like, it's almost like it's ten seconds of, of action, action yeah. spread out over, over but, five minutes. Yeah, but I mean, in the in the time before the actual action takes place, you've got I could not want to call him Banner because he's like Rex Banner from the, right. the Beer Baron episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> right, you seen it, right? Uh, uh yeah. Like he's, I, I'm not a, a Simpsons scholar yeah. like you are. It's a pastiche of, of the Untouchables, right? right? Uh, but his name's not that. It's Ness. Yeah. He's like waiting for the bookkeeper to show up. Mm. And there's a woman trying to like struggle to get a pram with a baby in it up the steps. Mm-hmm. And the baby's crying and he's getting like worked up by the stress of the situation. Yeah. So he goes down to help her. And as he does, he's been waiting for like so long. Yeah. And, he's, he's and still, then everything happens while he's down there, yeah. like in the middle, in no man's land. Yeah. Like yeah. About 50 gangsters walk in. Yeah. And he's got the baby pram in one hand and like his revolver in the other. Yeah. And let's go to the baby starts rolling down the steps and it's like oh, fucking hell it's just, the shootout happens like yeah. across the baby yeah <laughs> basically and the, like, the pram gets shot but the baby's okay yeah there's bullets pinging everywhere it's, yeah. and you're just like 
in it's, tears it's holding, holding, holding breath yeah. holding your breath the whole time yeah, yeah. and it's um yeah, it's it's very good. Like that scene is a, I think, a classic. Yeah, you yeah. know, cinema scene, and for good reason. Yeah. Um, and Andy Garcia sliding in at the end with yeah, his knee up. To yeah, save the but baby. that's that's like that's good fun, isn't yeah. it? It's like it's just like, yeah, yeah obviously ridiculous. Yeah. But it's um, that's the best part of the film. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it goes into a weird western scene. Mm. Another weird slasher movie scene. The um, first person yeah. camera when. Uh, Malone is in his apartment. Yeah. And we know that someone's about to try and murder him. Exactly. But we get like the Halloween style first, first person, person camera. With hands. And, yeah. yeah. He's very like Brian De Palma's in this film. He seems to be like just cherry picking stuff from <laughs> yeah. other genres of films. It's very strange. Yeah. It's a really weird film. Yeah. I think. It's good, but it's like, like it's kind of like a the best of the best of the yeah. um, Brian, golden Brian, age of yeah. American cinema. Brian, pa- Brian De Palma covers all your favorites. Yeah. Halloween murder scene, <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's a str- it's a really weird film to be like such a popular film and held mm. in such high regard. It's really strange. Yeah. Our first Kevin Costner film, mm. uh, our first Robert De Niro film, in fact. Really? Yeah, it's good. Good yeah. to finally get one under the belt. Yeah, not our first Andy Garcia film, though. No, you remember his, he turned up for five seconds at the end of Passengers. <laughs> what the fuck is that about? <laughs> yeah, in like the the worst, the world's worst fake beard as yeah. well. Yeah. Really weird. <laughs> he doesn't even have a line. No, I think I think there's an alternate version of the like you know an yeah. earlier cut where he's where he's in it a bit more. Yeah, but no, he, really did, he doesn't even stuff. say anything. He just no. he's just in it. Yeah, he he's not even. It's not even like recognizably Andy Garcia. No, like. Yeah, but he's he's great in this. I think he's the, like yeah, my favorite he's, character. When, when he's first introduced and he's doing like the gunplay, yeah, it's like surely they'd be like, "What the fuck are you doing?" Yeah, he's like got the gun in his like elastic waistband, yeah, and his shorts, and he like fucking points it at Sean Connery's face. Yeah. no one, no one's bothered by that. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> I like this guy. It's a it is a silly film. Yeah, it's very silly. It's very machismo. Very like, aren't gangsters fun? Is it the um, Pacific where? There's a load of soldiers at a firing range, and one of them, they're they're all holding their rifles, and one of them like turns round uh, when the officer starts speaking, and he like turns round, pointing his gun forward, basically. Mm. So it's now pointing at all the other soldiers, and the officer like runs up to him and goes, "What the fuck are you doing?" Like it like just yeah. smashes him over the head with it and stuff. Is that the Pacific? I think it's Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know, you know, like when we watch Titanic, mm. and there's uh, certain like looks at camera where they'd be like. Picasso, never heard of him. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think Mark Kermode calls it the chubby hmm. Right. Because in the Carpenters movie, well, there's it's, a scene it, where... It's the chubby hmm is a, um, I think it's John Ronson who coined the phrase. And okay. it's about um, in a biopic when so it's the, you it's see the Carpenters. The th- about, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Karen Carpenter reads a review where it says the chubby drummer. Yeah. And she says, chubby. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's like the... Uh, the scene in a biopic where they do the thing that they're famous for, basically, I think. Yeah, exactly. And this, the, in this one, that moment is, you know, we can't get him on his crimes. Yeah. But look at this. His taxes are all over the place. Yeah, so, exactly. Right. Yeah. I see what you're doing. Mm. They literally do the dusty book. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so with all that said, mm. how on earth, Chris, if you were living in 1930s Chicago, Mm. How would you survive? Well, um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, early on in the film, Elliot Ness comes home and um, Frank Nitti is parked outside of his house and he basically threatens his family, uh, threatens his daughter. Mm-hmm. And Elliot Ness runs inside his house, gun drawn, yeah. and then runs up to his daughter's bedroom and oh, like, yeah, yeah. hugs her, <laughs> holding the gun, yeah. finger on the trigger <laughs> the whole time. Right, don't do that. No. That's a bad idea, isn't it? Like the, like the police are trained to not uh, have their finger on the trigger. Yeah. Right, and he's he's got a um, semi-automatic pistol, which you don't need to cock to fire. Right. Yeah. And he's there, like cradling his daughter, who's so glad is alive and unhurt, while holding his pistol, holding a gun to it. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Like, it could very easily have been, like, a Pulp Fiction um, Marvin moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, it's pretty simple pretty simple advice it's bad practice to hug and hold like don't hug a child and a gun at the same time <laughs> no applying pressure like tightening yeah. the muscles in your arm with re- like with ecstatic uh like yeah. enthusiastic relief as well yeah. if she yeah. like if she spun around and said oh i gotta show you something yeah like oh let me show this drawing bang dead yeah, yeah. then what would happen He'd go, oh, Frank Nitti, you <laughs> bastard. He'd, he'd have to... He'd have to throw himself off the roof. He'd go buy a porcelain doll of her. <laughs> brick her up in the wall. Yeah. Spoilers. Oh, I don't care. So how about you, Joe? What's your first idea? So my first idea is for Al Capone. Okay. Strictly speaking, Al Capone doesn't die in the film. No. Does he? Dies a dies a form of death, though. Yeah, <laughs> professional death. Yeah, yeah. Um, reputational death. Yeah. So what does he? What does he get caught on? Remind me. Uh, tax evasion. And how? Uh, not paying his income tax. And how is that discovered? Um, because he keeps a ledger of payments to himself. Right. And you remember as well that in that ledger, Ness tricks the judge into. Uh, into thinking he's 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 been named because he's obviously yeah. a crooked judge and he's right. like, well yeah you're in the thing as well he's not actually in the ledger right but he obviously has been on the take from Capone so he's worried that he'll be revealed so he goes along with sure. putting Capone away. Um, so my advice for Capone is mm. to just write Ness's name in the ledger. Right. Okay. So when it's all going down, that'd like, be a twist, wouldn't yeah, it? Just a, a page at the back that says yeah. That, Edward Ness. And Ness is taken straight to the electric chair. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. It, yeah. it may not like completely absolve everyone, but it, was, is, it would disrupt That is a good the, point. Yeah. You could just, just write literally everyone's name in there. Write yeah. the president's name. Yeah. Write lawmakers' names. Yeah. Because um, th- clearly that's the only bit of admissible evidence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Mm. Uh, obviously he didn't know that the ledger was going to be found by the police. But if you're, if you're keeping records of your financial transactions... Mm. Just and they're all coded. Why not just write Edward like like you said, like show it up by just adding everyone's name. Like why? Let's say, um, the judge. You know, let's say his name wasn't there. So what? Mm. Like loads of people's names are in there, and they're all codified as well. Yeah. So he'd just go like, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the judge. Yeah. <laughs> like I I can do whatever I like, and I'm going to throw this case out. Yeah. Yeah, or keep the jury, or whatever. Yeah, that's a fair point, though. Like, just write the names of your enemies, like uh, mm. Mean Girls. Yeah, death Note. Be- burn mm. Book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... Contrasting uh, <laughs> thoughts. We <laughs> yeah, you've there. gone Mean Girls, I've gone Death Note. Very similar. Yeah. And I'm sure our, our listeners are the sort of people who've seen both. Mm. Yeah, get you a podcast that can do both. So that's my advice for Capone. Mm. Well, uh my second piece of advice is for all of the untouchables. And that's uh, if you're working on a campaign to try and stop a violent criminal uh, who may threaten you and your families, don't allow photos clearly identifying you and your team to be regularly published in the press. Yeah. That's an issue, isn't it? Because the way the photographer keeps coming back into the film, I genuinely thought... He was in on it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought he was going to be revealed to be a spy. Like... But it's not. It's mm. just that they don't think it through. Yeah, but do you think this is this is the thirties? So maybe like the tabloid press is still fairly young. People just aren't. It's used not to about it. the tabloid press. It's about like having any fundamental understanding of cause and effect. Right. Like if your if your if your aims are contrary to that of a violent criminal who has a history of being violent with people who disrupt his plans, and you allow your identity to be publicly revealed, mm. presumably just out of ego as well, because they're all like, oh, yeah, let's pose with the untouchables. Yeah. You, it's going to come back to you. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. So, it's, like, it have a bit more... You're paying a target on your head. Yeah, yeah. Have, have a bit more sense and, like, be a bit more uh, conservative with where your name and information appears. Yeah, that seems fair enough. Mm. Or just use a fake name. Yeah. Go undercover. Yeah, yeah. Any of these? Mm. Yeah, that's that's not an unfair idea. Mm. Um, my next piece of advice is for Ness. Mm-hmm. Now we often say, "How could you do a better job?" Sure. 
Uh, or maybe all the untouchables. Now, remind me again how Capone got caught? Uh, I believe it was tax evasion. Yeah, and how was that discovered? Uh, that was a ledger yeah. um, in which he kept note of all the payments to various people. Right, and now Ness gets the judge on side by saying your name's in the ledger mm -hmm. when it's not. Mm. Now, if the city as and the officials are as corrupt as they, they seem to be in the film, yeah, why didn't like Malone go up to his friend, the police chief, and go, your name's in the ledger and I'll take you in if you don't yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. if you don't tell me where the bookkeeper is mm. rather than like having a painful fight with him in the rain i suppose the the problem with malone doing that is that he needs the bookkeeper so in that regard he's basically saying like he's threatening him with the result of helping him like it, He's basically going, please, can you tell me where the bookkeeper is so that I may get the information <laughs> that I need to prosecute you? Yeah. So it's not in the chief's interest to give that right, information okay. over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you could say, like, I'll, I'll, I'll scrub your name out if you... Yeah. But then you're, then you're just as bad as Al Capone, surely. But that's the whole point of the film. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, fight fire with fire. Yeah. Fight gang lords with gang lords. Yeah. That's true. So what, in summary, is your uh, advice? Um, well, in in the in the rich vein of using the ledger against people, right? Just use it against the corrupt city officials to, right. to blackmail them into doing what you want, whether they're in it or not. As we've seen, it still works. Yeah. So either use it to frame people who aren't involved, or to like highlight the involvement of people who are. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Like with the first idea, it makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah. My final idea plays into uh, the big problem that I had with the ending, which mm. I went into earlier. Just legalized alcohol. <laughs> like, because clearly yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. And they think about doing it at the end. So there's not like a big moral panic no. at then, the time of the film. Yeah. And they did do it. Um, and like, if alcohol is legalized, Al Capone's racket has no reason to exist and no reason to commit violence. I mean, they they may still you know, move into other criminal avenues. Yeah, I mean, you into extortion and yeah. and stuff. But it's similar to the reasoning behind the war on drugs, isn't it? It's, it's like, you know, they're expending so much yeah. cost and like personnel and like, you know, if you legalized all drugs, then the, the criminal pathways that are funded by the production and sale of drugs, like suddenly lose all of that income because yeah. people can buy alcohol, they can buy drugs legally. So if people can all buy alcohol legally, after prohibition ends, then suddenly Al Capone's inco income drops significantly mm. and people are no longer like, you know, the entirety of Chicago is suddenly no longer funding oh, well, a, nice a violent criminal. Mm. That's true. I mean, that is essentially what happened. Mm. Um, a bit, anyway. Yeah. I mean, organised crime still exists. Yes. In different ways. Yeah. But you're right. Mm. That is one, you know... That's an institutional survival technique. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. So basically un unban alcohol mm. in order to cut off a the cash flow yeah, supply exactly. to Capone. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't disagree. Mm. Good. How about you? Any final thoughts? Yeah. Um if you're Capone, you don't seem to be worried about Is this about the ledger? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is once this. Right. Um now remind me how he was caught. <laughs> uh but He's obviously living in plain view of everyone. Like he doesn't really care that people know what he yeah, does. Yeah, he's, he he's showing off. He's into, he's into um, subterfuge as well. So he'll mm. say, like, something will happen and he'll say, I don't know anything about it. Or, like, prove it. Yeah, but it's he's insulated from it, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. So why doesn't he just hire some bum from, like, I don't mean a, a homeless person, but I mean, like, you know, you lousy bum. Yeah, some right? idiot. Yeah. yeah, some, like, street street soldier uh, in, his, in his gang. Mm. Go... You know the the guy Ness, yeah. Uh, go around his house and kill him. Yeah, I mean, like he, I, in, I know a bit about Capone, and I'm fairly sure he didn't shy away from killing anyone. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I wonder if it was sort of like because in real life, Al Capone didn't actually harm any of the Untouchables. Right. He he wasn't violent towards them. I think he knew that the more that you start indiscriminately right. killing law enforcement people, the <laughs> exactly. more likely they are to like, yeah, exactly, want yeah. to... Don't kick the hornet's nest. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, and instead, they he would do things like offer them two thousand dollars a week to mm, fuck off. Yeah, uh, which back in those days was an incredibly large amount of money. Um, yeah, so like I guess, like you say, he doesn't want to kick the hornet's nest, but he does kick the hornet's nest repeatedly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I I guess that's if, one of the things that's lost in translation from reality yeah. to the biopic. What thing. you what you do is you don't send like someone around to stand outside the hornet's nest yeah. and say, hey, wait nice for the, to have a nest. <laughs> yeah, wait for the hornet to come out and then <laughs> yeah. machine gun him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think like, yeah, perhaps it's, it's, it's all or nothing really, isn't it? Mm. Either kill all of them or like, you know, behave violently towards all of them yeah. or just try and butter them up. I mean, if you did it properly... Like, uh, what I'm saying is he sends Nitty around there, who's, yeah. like, obviously known to the police because he's friends with the mayor. Yeah. Right? And Nitty's like, ah, nice to have a family. Shame if something happened to him. And then drives off. Mm. So, well, Nitty's obviously a face in the Chicago crime scene. Yeah. So you, they're just able to pick him out of a lineup in, like, one sure. second. Yeah. So why not just send... But, like, the- if the police are corrupt anyway, it doesn't matter. If, if like, you have total faith in yeah. how corrupt the police are, then... Who cares? Just but kill yeah, them indiscriminately anyway. But don't even kill them. Yeah, but but make sure you the people you use don't don't send Nitty around because what I'm saying is Nitty is a known a known associate. Right. Right? Yeah. So, you, but, the higher, so higher you're saying the, more be more I, uh, insulated from it. Not even that. Just yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hire someone from Atlantic City to come down and yeah. kill someone. Yeah, but then you'd write Atlantic City hitman in your ledger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, twenty five dollars or whatever, and yeah. then uh, and then you'd get caught. Yeah. Because he didn't pay the income tax or the. Uh, <laughs> VAT on it. Atlantic City, mate. That's Bob Bob Empire. Hmm. Also uh, starring Al Capone. Capone. Yeah. Stephen when Graham. You said, when you said, I feel like I know a lot about Al Capone. Yeah. I've seen What Bob you Bob meant Empire. is, yeah, you'd watch No, I, I did a bit about him. Right. A little bit. But the... Um, yeah, well, Stephen, well, Stephen Graham. Who's yeah. better? Who's a better Capone? Well, Stephen. this is what I was thinking is, is Stephen Graham doing... Is he acting like Capone or is he liking acting like De Niro's Capone? Because mm. he, like... They're, I don't, I don't know that The Untouchables is so iconic that no. it would be one of those situations. No, maybe not. But it's, it's the sticking at their hands, talking like this, mm. what am I going to do? Huh? What am I going to yeah. do? Right. But he, but Capone in this film is just angry Robert De Niro, really, yeah, isn't yeah. it? It's not like Robert De Niro is a famous like method actor no. and he's like, you watch it and you go, like, oh my God, I can't even believe it's Robert De Niro. <laughs> it's like, it's very obvious. <laughs> it's Robert Robert yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, because he's fat, he put on the weight to play Capone. But he didn't put on the weight. He he put like cushions on. No, he did put on weight. No, he didn't. Really, he, he had he, he, ha- he had no like. F- quite famously, he had no time right. to put the weight on. So he's he's wearing like a fat suit basically. Right. Okay. I thought he wanted to put the weight on, but no. right, maybe he did. But he in Raging Bull, for instance, that that is a ma- like that is a masterpiece of a film, and yeah. he's amazing in it. Mm. And it's like he's just playing his Jake the Motor character. But as like with with a yeah, thick Chicago accent, exactly, yeah, yeah. like j- retired version, yeah, yeah. So that was the Untouchables. If you'd like to get in touchables with us, nice, yeah, yeah, uh, you can on email, which is what uh, Simon Todd did when he recommended this film to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, well done, Simon. We covered it. Hope you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> how yeah. to survive show at gmail dot com is the email address. Yeah, Simon didn't leave any suggestions on how to survive in his mm. email. But you do get in touch, Simon, if you have got any thoughts. How to survive show at gmail.com. Maybe you could tell us how you'd survive any of the films we've covered. Mm. You know, they, they're not um, suddenly out of date films. Sure. It's not that they're inaccessible now. You can go back and watch them. Yeah. And we still read your emails and we'll still read them out. Yeah. And we've covered such great films recently. Yeah. Like The Boy, Jigsaw, Saw 1, Saw 2, Saw 3. Video still available at how to survive show. Dot com. Yeah. Well, we, we, just a reminder, we tied ourselves to a wall, chained ourselves to a wall yeah. for 11 hours of Saw movies. Mm. Um, and it was awful. And we made a video of it and you can watch it. Yeah. How to survive show.com. Mm. You can also get in touch on Twitter at how to survive pod, facebook.com forward slash how to survive pod. And leave us a five star review. Mm. That can be like your bribe. We're, you know, you think we're untouchable. You actually, you can give us a five star review and we'll, carry on making top quality movie review podcast with a twist yes yeah what we got next week Joe? next week chris another listener suggestion yeah yeah we'll be so nice to our listeners lately yeah because they're so nice to us by Mm. listening in and emailing in yeah that movie is uh the latest s craig zala film yeah uh latest of two Mm -hmm. first one being bone tomahawk this one being 
Brawl in Cell Block 99. Mm. Stuart Baxter recommended it. And I was rather rude about his appraisal of Vince Vaughn's yeah. acting skills. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I, I, I was unfair. Yeah, well, we'll see, see how he is uh, yeah. in, in the film. So thanks, Stuart, for recommending that. And we'll see you next week, everyone, for mm. Cell Block 99, which is available on Amazon. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's sort of a simultaneous release in the cinemas and on uh, video on demand. Of course, that's really the way um, film releases it's are going to go. The movie's the going, yeah. yeah. Uh, eventually, you make Disney, it'll be over in their own platforms so for you to watch the movies instead of going to the cinema. Sure. Uh, Eventually, they're, what they'll do is they'll start like, um, the film companies will start like actually building destinations for people to go to, mm. to watch the films as like an event. And it would be like a sort of social space yeah. and like a building where people will all go and they'll buy tickets mm -hmm. and maybe get some snacks and then sit in a room and watch the film. Yeah, together. Yeah. And then afterwards, maybe um, go for a meal and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Oh, a boy can dream. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, next week, Brawl in Cell Block 99. Available on Amazon. Tell us what you think about it. How to survive show at gmail.com. And we will see you next week. Nice podcast you got. Shame if something happened to it. 